There was an eighth son of an eighth son, and naturally he was a wizard, and there it should have ended. However... <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Friday Fantasy Show from the Bottled Imp, exploring the realms of fantasy. My name is Ken Pointer, and today we are taking a look at sorcery or sousery. It's a play on words. Yes, it is another Discworld novel by Sir Terry Pratchett, and this is book five, apparently, of 41 Discworld novels. Oh, yes, the man was prolific. Now, I have read quite a few now, and we are doing every single book. That is the aim, every single Discworld book. And this is another standalone novel, so if you've never read a Terry Pratchett, you can just dip into this one. Well, let's find out just what it's all about. <laughs> so what is sorcery all about? Well, the setup is fairly straightforward, kind of. It's a little bit mathy. I'll explain. On the Discworld, which is, as it sounds, a disc. You might not know this, but you probably do. But anyway, it's a disc, so the world is flat, yes? It's flat disc that's resting on the shoulders of four elephants that themselves are resting on a giant turtle that is in space, just like other planets. So we've already got a slight quirky world set up, but on the disc world, a wizard is an eighth son of an eighth son, but not only that, it goes further. A sorcerer is an eighth son of an eighth son of an eighth son. It's a wizard squared. I told you it was mathy, but fairly straightforward to understand. So sorcerers are, basically they are vastly more powerful than wizards. And they were responsible, this is the sort of backstory, they're responsible for a cataclysmic, carefully I say that, mage war that happened that devastated a lot of the Discworld. So it was one of the big events in history of the Discworld. And that's why wizards, so, so in order to prevent that happening again, they kind of wanted to outlaw sorcerers. And the way they did it was they then forbid wizards to marry or to have any children. And then you kind of think, yeah, but surely wizards would die out because there wouldn't be any children. But I don't think that's explained in the book. Hmm, we'll overlook that. Anyway, there was one situation where a sorcerer is actually born. Yes, Ipslaw, I think that's how you pronounce it, Ipslaw the Red. He is a banished wizard who has married and has had children, hence why he's been banished. So, because he's banished from the Unseen University where all the wizards hang out, and he's, he's, he hates that, he hates being banished, he hates being shunned by his fellow wizards, so he vows revenge on the wizards and the Unseen University. So, he does have indeed an eighth son of an eighth son of an eighth son. Well, he doesn't have that. He has the third generation eighth son. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe it was more complicated. <laughs> and he has named his child Coin. Again, I think that's how you pronounce it. It's spelled C-O-I-N, Cohen, I guess you could have it. And the way that he seeks his revenge, Ipslaw is on his deathbed and he, tr he tries to cheat death and he kind of does that very successfully by kind of manifesting himself or magic king himself into a staff, a magical staff, which all wizards have. And from there, he uses that con to control his son, Coin. And therefore, Coin then starts going along and seeks the revenge that Ipslaw wants on the wizards and the university. So obviously, there's going to be many themes that run through a book like this. Revenge is the big obvious one. And as, as I say, Ipslaw has been banished from the Unseen University. He wants to punish the wizards. So it's purely out of spite. There's no noble revenge. Can revenge be noble? I guess it kind of could be argued that revenge could be noble. But for this, this is just simply, well, you know, 
You've you've shunned me. I, you know, but he broke the laws. He broke the rules of being a wizard, and they were there for good reason because a sorcerer is too powerful. So what he does is he starts to control his son. So there's that other theme of control and also living through your children. Any you know kids that have had pushy parents, you know, they push them to do well in life. Again, there's that debate, is it, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, do the kids really want to do that? So, in this case, Coin isn't really anything to do with the revenge, it's not his revenge, you know, he didn't ask for that. So, he's born into this situation and he goes along with it because he's magically controlled, so he kind of has to go along with it, so he reluctantly goes along with it. There's the theme of war, so as I said, the wizards were, um, they want to stop Coin from taking control of the of the university, the unseen university, because if there are too many more sorcerers that are going to, you know, if, if it's then the, the, the next phase is that we're going to banish the wizards and the sorcerers are going to take charge, then obviously there's going to be a war because nobody wants that. Nobody, you know, the wizards, they are seen as sort of ineffectual. They're not, they don't really mess around with politics anymore. They don't get involved. So they kind of like, you, you know, society kind of tolerates them or kind of ignores them. Whereas sorcerers seem to have, you know, they, they have their magic from a different place. And so it's seen as that they've become powerful. So you're going to get war. And obviously you've already had the war. So war is quite a theme that's sort of in the background, but it kind of is a driving force for the conflict in the book. And this is where Rincewind comes into it. So Rincewind was one of the original main characters in The Colour of Magic, which is book one. And this is, I think, the third appearance or maybe fourth appearance uh, no, I think it's his third book that Rincewind is involved with as one of the main characters. So people, fans of Rincewind, yeah, he's in it, he's one of the main characters, and he takes up on the side of the wizard. He is a wizard, for those of you that don't know, he's a wizard, but a very cowardly one, and not a very good wizard. He kind of just bumbles through life. So he kind of, but he sort of gets hoodwinked or, or, or drawn into this battle and decides that it is a good cause to sort of fight for. But he kind of does it in his own way, his own sort of cowardly way. And there is the theme of father and son relationship, as I kind of briefly mentioned before. How does a father have that massive influence over their sons, daughters, you know, their, 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 their offspring? And of course, it's kind of a natural thing, because as a child, you look up to your family, you look up to your parents, especially, or guardians or adults for the way to behave, for, you know, how life is learned. That's how we learn. We imitate, don't we? We learn language, we're listening. We're listening about language, and that's how it's formed. We imitate. So obviously, the main people in your family, in your life, is going to be your parents, and you are going to kind of, you trust them. You kind of, kids have this natural trust, don't they? Unless it sort of starts to get broken, and as they grow older, they then start to kind of realise, oh, actually, not everything as it is as it seems, and there are choices. And when you get a lot older, you start to learn that your parents are just kind of normal people that, that will make mistakes and do have kind of maybe sort of, you know, weird opinions about stuff, or, or you know, maybe not, as the case may be. But they, they kind of not, they, they sort of change. They're not just parents. They're fully rounded people. And so that then becomes a conflict because it's like, well, do I believe in what my parents believe in? So obviously this father, Ypsilor, wants revenge on the Unseen University and the wizards. So do you take your parents' views? And then if you don't, if you naturally kind of disagree with them, then well, what do you do about that? Do you confront or do you kind of just ignore and nod your head? And so again, you know, I think, you know, politics is one of those subjects that divides people. Religion divides families as well. And I think that's because when you know, naturally we want to kind of be our own people, don't we? We kind of want to explore the world. We want to kind of find our own opinions about things. So that's where the conflict comes as well, because eventually, oh, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but Coin starts to question his father's motive and what actually he's doing. So you've got that wrestle with ethics, you know, should you follow your parents' beliefs just out of, you know, loyalty, or should you actually start questioning them? And I'm on the camp that you should start questioning things, you start questioning everything. And yeah, you might then go back to be in agreement with your parents, or, or the religion, or politics, or whatever, but at least question it because it's critical thinking, and that is what makes us have our own individual opinions, isn't it? 
And you do have power as a theme, power and the order of things. This is how things are done. It's just natural. This is what, you know, people have that kind of opinion. You know, oh, we've always done it like that. Yeah, but well, that doesn't mean we always continue to do it like that. So wizards are the ones here that have made the rules, haven't they? They're the ones that say, right, yeah, we're gonna banish, you can't marry, you can't have any children. And I guess because they're magic users, they kind of have a certain amount of power. But it has, as I say, they've kind of self excluded from society in that way because I guess being wizards you could just walk into any place and just be and try and dominate it so they kind of have power but they don't really use it so again that's a nice little theme to sort of say well actually yeah we could do this but we're not going to we're not interested in power so you you know and, and I guess any there is always that dichotomy of if the, the, the group of people that have the power versus the people that don't have the power and then the people that don't have the power they you know the question is well why should you have the power you know and again there's that poor rich divide in a lot of societies there's always the people that seem to be rich that have the power and influence and the poor people don't and is there any other way of doing it you know so you've got that and it creates that that just tension throughout the whole kind of every bit of aspect of society is all about the power of things so they, the wizards, I guess, would just say, well, look, we're protecting you from sorcerers. So I guess there's that sort of, well, listen to us, we know, you know, we know what we're talking about. So overall, yes, I, with, ah, what I'm finding is I have certain books in this, in, in my quest to read all 41 Discworld books, is of the five that I've reviewed now so far, I've got mixed feelings about this one. And it's interesting, because I'm reading them in publication day, I'm seeing the development of his writing, of, of Terry Pratchett's writing, and I'm seeing the development of his ideas and the way that he's shaping the disc world and his, as he gets to know the disc world a bit more and he's, you know, he's exploring it a bit more and, and creating it, it's becoming clearer and clearer. So yes, there are lots of positives about this book, plus there are you know, some negatives, hence why I said there's mixed feelings. So the positives are the quality of writing has improved drastically since book one. Um, book one and book two, The Colour of Magic and The Light Fantastic, I found a little bit up and down with the quality of writing and the plot was a bit jumpy and it was a little bit, and it seemed like he had loads of ideas and he wanted to just cram them all in and that he wrote jokes and then wanted to put the jokes in, so then wrote plots around the jokes, as opposed to going, you know what? Let's create character. I don't know where that came from. Let's create characters and story. And then, if there are jokes and humour that come of that and other situations that are created, then so much the better. And that's what he's learned to do. And it sounds like I'm patronising him, and he's written. He's a he's a best-selling author. He knows what he was doing when he wrote these, you know. But but again, you know, early on. You find your feet as a writer. So he, he's, he's beginning to really get to grips with story and character. The world that he's set up now, this is the main advancement for me, is that he really starts to know the law of what he's trying to do, of the rules. Bless you, Julian. <laughs> Some magic going on over there as well. What are sneezes? Yes, leave comments if you know what are sneezes. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so he's created this world, he's created the rules, so we get a greater understanding of what the rules are, of, you know, if you can't, you can't just, you know, what are the rules of magic? So now he's exploring that even further. It, the positive, another positive, it's fun, it's light-hearted, there's a good light-hearted nature of the story. Um, it, it does deal with a few heavy issues, as I explained previously, but on the whole, the tone is light, so that's good, you know, if you do want a light humour, and they are meant to be humorous, so you don't, you don't, you're not expecting gritty Game of Thrones type stuff here, and obviously you don't get that, but, but you know, that's why I think when you read something or choose something to watch or listen to, you kind of, you know, you've got to do a little bit of research, because, you, you know, if you, if you read something and you want something gritty, and you've picked a, a comedy, then of course you're going to be disappointed. The negatives, well, I do struggle, I'm going to say this, and Terry Patrick fans may hate me for this. I struggle with the character of Rincewind. There, I've said it. He's a fun character, but I just find him a bit flat. There's not a lot of roundness to him. I don't know too much about him. I, I need more of a character. And he does seem to, you know, yes, he's a coward and he's not very good at magic, but that seems to be it. I don't know his background. He's not, I, you know, I want to know more about him. I want to know, and there doesn't ever seem to be a story arc with Rincewind. Now, I might be wrong about this in future books, but it just seems to, he's, you know, he's like that at the beginning of a book and he's like that at the end of the book. This one, there is a little bit of a story arc for him, but not enough for me to really kind of care and go, wow, you know, he's really gone through something here. So I, maybe I'm overthinking this. I don't know, but 
I don't know, I, I'm never quite connected with Rince Wynn. Whereas, for some of the previous books, um, like The Witches in some Equal Rights, I connected instantly with them. I don't know why, Granny Weatherwax, I kind of connected. It, it seemed a more interesting character, maybe. It just seemed more well-rounded. And the story, you know, I mentioned how he has improved the story. Well, with this one, it kind of, it's almost like it's taken a step back for me. The story wasn't as gripping as, say, Mort, uh, which I think was the fourth book, and Equal Rights, which dealt with all about, you know, equality of the sexes. So, for some reason, this story didn't grip me as much. But there is enough in there to warrant having a read of it, you know, especially if you do like the character of Rince Wind. There you go, sorcery. Sorcery? Ooh, saucy. <laughs> Terry Pratchett's sorcery, sorcery. However you want to say it, sorry. Yes, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed that review of the Terry Pratchett book. It's the fifth in the series. And I think it was a great decision where books one and two, The Light Fantastic, well, book two, hang on, let me say that again. The Colour of Magic, book one, and The Light Fantastic, book two, are actually, it's a sequel, they're tied together. These, now, from then on though, book three onwards, were standalone. Yes, they have recurring characters, and I think that's the, that was a genius idea, simply because it does mean that, you know, if you've got 41 books and they're all linked, you know, and they're like a story link, are you really then, you know, once they're written, going to go, right, hmm, let me start the Discworld series. It's 41 books, book one. No, I don't think you are. So standalone is perfect because you can dip in and out of them. And that's sort of altered my opinion because I've, I've got a book, the, um, the Legend of Grimace Ironblood, and that's book one. And I think I'm going to do the same. I think I'm going to write a trilogy and then every other book that I write will then be a standalone book, but set in that universe and maybe have reoccurring characters as well. We have, as I say, mentioned before, we reviewed all the other Terry Pratchett books up to book five, and we will be continuing. So check them out as and when they come up on the YouTube channel. Remember to keep it unreal, especially if you